Well, good evening. Happy Sabbath. And we're going to continue our study here um, on righteousness by faith. The third angel's messages of right, the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith by reading from A.T. Jones. And um, we're going to just review a little bit um, here. But uh, before we begin, uh, let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we can once again enter into the Sabbath hours and know that your presence is here. We know the struggles that we face each day in this world of sin and suffering. We see those suffering around us that we are often unable to help, though we know that we can pray for them and that we can do what we can but often people have made choices we know lord that we are no different we need you that we cannot save ourselves but that we must cooperate with you in the work of salvation in your work that you are doing in our lives we pray that you can be here now in this study and that the things we study can help us, not just individually, but help us in our ministry to those around us. We need to be prepared for the time ahead, but we also need to be prepared to give a message of warning. And so we ask, Lord, that these things we study will help us. Give us clear and understanding minds and open hearts to your word. May your Holy Spirit speak to us directly. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Again, happy Sabbath. And going through these studies of Jones has been, <clears throat> as I sort of warn people, a bit, a bit repetitive. But I think this repetition, Jones' way of, of writing, and of course, how we're relating this to our time, um, really helps us to analyze what's happening and helps us to analyze um, the principles behind what's happening. Now, Jones has been going through this idea that he's in the time of Revelation 18, that this other angel has arrived, that we're, we're basically in the Sunday law. And now we, we understand how Jeff first looked at this message of Revelation 18, as Ellen White did, as, as a reference to the Sunday law. But of course, we've moved it over to 9-11. And we can see that Jones is not wrong, but he's not fully right. That is, he doesn't understand that he is in a typical line, just as we are. that the events that happen in connection with, you know, 1888 and 1893 is part of that. Um, Jones doesn't understand that, that that message has ended, that the message has been rejected, even though the work that's happening in this 1893 camp meeting, Ellen White recognizes that the Holy Spirit is working and that this message is causing a, a confession and a repentance which is necessary. So a lot of things here are marking that Jones is correct. But we know, of course, that the Sunday law doesn't come in that history. It fails. The work fails because the message of 1888 is ultimately rejected by the church. So we've looked at this in our times and we can see all these parallels. We can see uh, brothers um, Stanton, and uh, what's his name? Can't think of his name. It starts with a C. It's not Canwright because Canwright's the other guy. Um, I'd have to look back and see. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, that was, um, and it, I know it's. 
Stanton and Caldwell, right? So Brother Caldwell and Brother Stanton, they're basically giving a message to leave the Adventist church. Um, and so we can see that while they, and they were at the 1893 camp meeting. So Ellen White's writing about them after she's writing this letter to them, responding uh, to what's happening. Uh, they, uh, there's a telegram sent to Ellen White from Brother Caldwell and Ellen White responds to that. And that's Testimonies to Ministers, page 32 to 62. So, um, so we have this parallel with our time, that is, there is a false message and there's a true message. But also, we have a typical message as well. So what we're learning from this, um, can somebody give us a summary of what the main thing is that we've learned about our present situation as we've read through uh, what Jones is talking about in his time? Maybe people don't remember. So he says, I'll ask this question again, but I'll read a bit first and think about the question that I asked. What is the main point? So this is a bit of a review. We're going back a couple of pages. So Joan says, brethren, we are in the grandest time this world ever saw. Oh, that we may consecrate ourselves to God as becomes us who are living in this grandest of times. I shall read you at another time a statement from volume four, how that great numbers of ministers will turn to the truth of the third angel's message under the loud cry. So he believes revelation has begun and the loud cry is going to begin, which is going to lead to the Sunday law. Many of the ministers who now think that this Sunday law work and all this is all right, they do not see what is under it. And in a sense, he's saying that the Sunday law has happened and, and the message is swelling to a loud cry, right? <clears throat> uh, they do not see what is under it. When the papacy begins to move a little more openly, they will back out of the whole thing. They will cut loose from that thing. But where can they go? To the third angel's message. Thank the Lord. I tell you, brethren, the power of God is going to do something right away. Oh, that we may surrender all things to him that he may lead. So he's saying we have this third angel's message and there's this call to come out of Babylon. And where can people go? <clears throat> The only place they can go if they recognize what's happening is to this third angel's message. So Adventists have this third angel's message that people can go to. He says, let me read here the aims of the papacy as set forth in her own words. Now, he's going to read, and, we, and we've read some of this, right? So this is where he says that this is uh, basically authoritative. And he's talking about the work that Leo the Thirteenth, who's the Pope at the time, is uh, his appeal for national unification, right? So the idea here that's being presented in this um, uh, paper, this American uh, paper, is that um, the United States is a model of what the church should be in the way that it's structured. So they're going to be structuring uh, this sort of unification that they see happening in the United States. That it's what it needs to be the model for the church, the Catholic church. So again, I ask the question, what is it that we have learned as we've read through Jones here? That one of the main things that we've learned in this regard about what's happening now. How do we apply this now? Because this is the papal spirit that's being referred to. That's what Jones is seeing. Where do we look for it in this movement? Where, where, where does the movement try to see the parallel? Let's put it that way. In many ways, they've seen the parallel outside of the movement, but not within the movement. Yet, it has existed within the movement in very subtle manners. So one of the things that we've been learning through all of our studies is that if we're going to call people out of Babylon, we have to be out of Babylon ourselves. Yes. 
and that there needs to be this preparatory work so that we can um, accomplish the work that we're given to do. So there's a preparation for the work, and then there's the work itself, which is a giving of a message. And yet, we're not out of Babylon, right? Now, we like to point to the church as being Babylon, but, you know, when Ellen White's writing to Brother Stanton in Caldwell, I mean, they need this conversion process. They're saying the church is Babylon. But, but they themselves don't really understand what Babylon is. And I think this is part of the problem, is that we can be enacting the spirit of Babylon in how we treat one another, how we study the Bible, how we deal with those that differ from us. And that this demonstrates that we're in no way prepared to give a message to call people out of Babylon because we're just going to be calling them into Babylon. <clears throat> My wife agrees with me. Now, um, so it says, finally, Leo the 13th desires to see strength in that unity. Like all intuitive souls, he hails in the United America. Now, this is not Jones writing. This is this paper. Like all intuitive souls, he hails in the United American states and in their young and flourishing church, the source of a new life for Europeans. He wants America to be powerful in order that Europe may regain, regain strength from borrowing a rejuvenated type. So America is now seen as this this model um, in which Europe and also the church is to be uh, uh, molding itself. So Jones interjects here. He says, and I tell you another thing right here, brethren, when things have come to that pass in the government of the United States that the papacy can afford to set forth her purposes and intentions as plainly as that. I tell you, they are pretty far gone. The papacy doesn't speak openly until she knows she has the advantage. She always works underneath and secretly until the time comes to spring. And she doesn't spring until she is ready. And when the affairs of the United States are so under the control of the papacy that she can talk like that openly to the people of the United States, then things are in a shape satisfactory to the papacy and of course we know this to be the case um that that satan and not just the papacy works secretly their purposes are hidden uh they have an agenda on the outside that appears good but there comes a point where they can sort of show their hand because everyone's behind it people have bought in we see this with the World Economic Forum. Uh, they're not really hiding anything they're doing. Uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, the papacy isn't hiding what it's doing. Now, it is true, though, um, that Jones here is, is not seeing all that has to happen. So there are still things that are quite hidden that Jones isn't, isn't seeing exposed. But anyway... They, this uh, paper goes on. Europe is closely watching the United States. Thir certain things may frighten some people, but the general attraction is invincible. Bryce, Claudio, Fanet, Charlies, and all the historians and publicists have the inclusiveness of the record. Henceforth, we will need authors who will place themselves upon this ground. What can we borrow and what ought we to borrow from the United States for our social, political, and ecclesiastical reorganization. <clears throat> um, so Jones interjects again. He says, until 1892, what could any European no nation or any other nation borrow from this government for a ecclesiastical reorganization? Nothing. What had this government to do with ecclesiastical affairs? The Constitution was absolutely pledged against the whole thing. But now, since the cost Constitution, <coughs> excuse me, has been overridden, the papacy can begin to ask, what can we borrow from the United States for our ecclesiastical reorganization? But the example has been set and the thing has been done, which has put the United States into a place 
where the papacy can borrow from the United States example and influence for ecclesiastical reorganization in Europe and all other nations. And she is doing it. She is borrowing and using it for her purposes now. And from the Pope's particular point of view, what are the examples that these American Catholics are giving us? The problem is difficult, but in its wanderings and immense variety, it captivates all strong and far-reaching minds. Of course, this is again from this paper. The answer depends in a great measure upon the development of American destinies. If the United States succeeded, or succeed, if the United States succeed in solving the many problems that puzzle us, Europe will follow their example. And this outpouring of light will mark a date in the history, not only of the United States, but of all humanity. Now, it's interesting, because um, I see a parallel here with the World Economic Forum. In, now, you know, I've read some books recently dealing with the economic and political philosophy of the Catholic Church. Now, the Catholic Church, in its philosophy, in economics and in politics is really socialist, right? It, it doesn't believe in the free market. It doesn't believe in uh, capitalism. And, and we see this with, of course, the World Economic Forum. It, it aligns with the principles that the Catholic Church operates under. But one of the problems that both the World Economic Forum have and the papacy and, and any country that follows socialist economic principles is that they don't work. They keep trying. Um, the World Economic Forum, um, one of the, the reason why it thinks it can succeed now is because we have computers that can uh, basically gather this information for us about people's actions, and we can also mold and direct people's actions, which was part of the problem um, that's called the knowledge problem in, in communism. That is, the governments can't, couldn't figure out what people wanted to buy or needed to buy. They tried to create a, um, uh, a command economy, and of course, people don't act the way that you want them to act. So if we can read their minds, so to speak, by, you know, watching what they do on the internet, um, and we not only just read their minds, but manipulate them so that their desires are the desires that, that the state wants, then we can have uh, a government and an economy that in 2030, nobody will own anything and be happy about it, Right. But we can see that that problem still exists. Human nature is not as controllable as the World Economic Forum would hope. That is, their ideas are pie in the sky. They're not something that are really going to, to work. And this is the problem with the Catholic Church. Now, does the United States move towards um, socialism in, in its history? prior to, you know, the present time, since, you know, 1892. Has the United States moved in a socialist direction, socialist economic policies? Where would we first see this? Social Security. Okay, well, Social Security. Now, now, of course, these things happen gradually over time. Uh, the Great Depression, uh, what happened during the Great Depression that we would call uh, socialist, this command economy? Uh, didn't they have, like, uh, work programs, um, you know, work for food or work for money? Work Progress Administration, the WPA. That was it, WPA. What about wage and price control? Yes. Uh, no. Wage and price control was more Nixon in the 70s. Okay. Well, my understanding, there was wage and price control during the Great Depression. Hmm. Okay. So I stand ready to be correct. Yeah. 
Yeah. So there was wage and price control during the Great Depression. Um, the idea was, well, business needs to make money. And if the because what happens in a depression is the, the price of things go down to meet the supply and demand. Right. So the market adjusts to the fact uh, that people don't have much money. So they kept um, the price of certain goods high so that people couldn't afford them because the idea is that business needed uh, to be able to make a profit. But what they didn't understand is if you have a free market, what the whole system adjusts so that people actually get their needs provided. Also during the Great Depression, there was times that they would destroy food grain and such um, because there would be too, too much on the market at the price that they had it. So they would destroy it where if they had it cheaper, everybody could have food. So, so we had these, these ideas floating around during the great depression. That's probably where they first really start to come in. We could, you know, also look at what happened during the war. This is a progressive idea um, we have Keynesian economic ideas influencing the United States, which border on socialist ideas and principles. But uh, the point, I guess, here is that the United States has experimented with certain, certain um, um, elements of socialist philosophy they put them into practice, but they've never been successful. And they're, and they're never going to be successful because they ignore reality. Uh, there's a lot more behind it. I don't want to go into a bunch of economics here. But um, this is part of the problem that the papacy has always had. Is that their ideas um, are destructive. Now, some people argue that that is the purpose of these ideas. And, and that may be true, that Satan would be behind it, and he's seeking to destroy basically Republican government by destroying this United States of America that has these principles that are biblical principles and how they operate, the Constitution. And which also relate to economic principles because people have freedom to make economic choices. And of course, you can, you, the left would argue that, well, these choices, they're unfair. Some people benefit and some people don't. And that's true. But would it be better that some people benefit and some people don't, then no one benefits. Because under socialism, no one benefits except the wealthy class, those in power. They're the only ones that don't suffer. So there's decisions. No, they don't have to bear any of the consequences of their policies. <clears throat> so, so we have this, this parallel, I guess, with the ideas that we studied regarding the World Economic Forum and what we see coming on this world with what Jones is seeing in regard to the Catholics. Now, am I seeing that correctly or am I just um, reading into it? Anybody, any thoughts on that? Okay, well, let's go on and read here. So we're going to read more from this paper here. Um, um, I don't know what res vestra agitor is, is what we might then say to Americans. That is why the Holy Father, anxious for peace and strength, collaborates with passion in the work of consolidation and development in American affairs. According to him, the church ought to be the chosen crucible 
for the molding and the absorption of races into one united family. And that especially is the reason why he labors at the codification of ecclesiastical affairs in order that this distant member of Christianity may infuse new blood into the old organism. Um, <clears throat> I think he's a little misguided, of course, but Jones interjects. He says, brethren, can anybody in the world shut his eyes to this that is taking place before us? That this that is even taking place before the whole world. Can anybody see what is taking place before him? Do we know what is soon to come upon us by that thing that is taking place before us? But the papacy not only proclaims her purpose, she follows it swiftly with a bold stroke to carry it into effect. That special representative of the Pope, that permanent apostolic delegation, which was established in this country only the other day. What does that mean? Monsignor Saltoli came to this country as the Pope's personal representative to attend the opening exercises of the World's Fair. A good excuse. Professedly, he came as any other would come on a special mission. But when he got over here, then he was to stay a while, temporarily as delegate of the Pope. But there was an offside party in the Catholic Church who began to say, we don't want him. Then the Pope simply established him forever. This is the account of it in the New York Sun. <clears throat> Rome, January 14th. The Pope has decided to establish a permanent apostolic delegation in the United States and has nominated, um, I'm not sure exactly what MGR, how you would pronounce this. Um, Monsignor. Okay, I was wondering if that's what it was, Monsignor. I don't know if I would use that abbreviation, but anyway, Monsignor Satoli to be the first delegate. This decision the Vatican considers to be a sufficient reply to the opposition of Monsignor Satoli and his mission. The propaganda will send by the Reverend F. Z. Rooker the documents authenticating the new power conferred upon Monsignor, Monsignor Satoli as permanent delegate. Pope Leo is said to be greatly interested in the situation in America and desirous of putting an, an end to the ecclesiastical differences existing there. With this purpose, the Pope is preparing an encyclical to the American Episcopate, advising harmony and union. Okay, so I mean, I'm not going to go into all of this here, but basically the idea is he sees that the Catholic Church is moving swiftly, it's acting um, to put in place uh, people and policies to influence the United States in the direction that it wants it to go. And um, so I'm not going to read all this. So this is just Jones quoting. So he says, there are other things that have taken place in connection with the matter of public money to the churches. The Catholic Church is getting nearly all of it now because of the Methodists, Baptists, and Episcopalians have refused to receive any more money from the government. And leading ministers of the Presbyterian Church are trying to get that church to refuse to take any more money from the government. Soon, therefore, the Catholic Church will be getting money, almost wholly alone from the public treasury, nearly $400,000 a year, which is quite a bit of money. Then will, will Protestants stand by and allow the Catholics to have that money without raising a wonderful opposition against it? But it will do no good for them to protest against it. If they protest against it as unconstitutional, the Catholic Church can simply reply, reply, this is a Christian nation. The Supreme Court has decided that this is a Christian nation. And to prove it, the court has cited the decree of Ferdinand and Isabella, who were Catholics only, and who sent out Columbus, who was a Catholic, to discover new worlds that they might bring them to God and to the Christian religion. And the only religion that Ferdinand and Isabella or Columbus meant or had anything to do with was the Catholic religion. When the Supreme Court cites that that decree to prove that this is a Christian nation, that proves that it is a Catholic Christian nation. That is, the argument of the Catholic Church may make, and Protestants cannot succeed. This is the argument the Catholic Church may make, and Protestants cannot successfully dispute it. Protestants cannot deny the constitutionality of the argument because they have used the Supreme Court decision for their own interests, for their own purposes, in Sunday legislation. 
They have endorsed the decision as all right. And when they have used the decision for their own purposes, they cannot go back on it. When the papacy uses it for her purposes, they are caught as firmly as ever anything was ever caught in a trap. And the only way they can ever get out of the trap is by having the Lord Jesus Christ deliver them from the iniquity of it by the third angel's message. Is it not time they were having that message? Now, one of the things that we have faced as Seventh-day Adventists is what is the role of the Catholic Church in last day's events? And how does that relate to the role of the Protestants? Now, some and, and people may have not have thought about this because I think in some ways Adventists are sort of double minded. Um, there are some uh, ministers and, and writers, ministries that really focus a lot upon what the Catholic Church is doing. That is, that seems to be for them the place where this Sunday law comes from, even if it's not. Um, instituted by the, the papacy itself, the United States is going to bring this Sunday law. But they see it as the alliance of the United States with the papacy. Now, some people focus more upon the Protestants themselves as the originator of the Sunday law. Of course, they're, they, they still both have the Protestants and the Catholics working together. But it's sort of the Protestants who are the lead Now, if we look at, at, at what Ellen White says about the Sunday law, I think we would probably have to say that even though the Catholic Church, it's, it's the child of the papacy that the Sunday is, that it's that Protestants have become like Catholics. It doesn't mean that the Catholic Church has to have direct control in instituting Sunday observance, if the Protestants themselves are the ones who are who are behind it. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Any any thoughts on this? Because what Jones is doing is he's he's been looking at what the Protestants have done, but he's moved over to the Catholic Church, that the Catholic Church needs to be involved. Why has he done that? Does Ellen White do this? No. No, she doesn't, okay? It's the Protestants, it's the United States that brings in the Sunday law. Now, it's operating on... on principles that had been put forward by the by the catholic church and and sure we know that the catholic church is still behind things but the catholic church itself doesn't need to to be involved here and 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 when we look at this about the money going to the catholic church well we in hindsight can understand that really protestants have definitely not continued in a position where they're not going to take any more money from the government Right. We looked at, at how Protestants and the Seventh Day Adventist Church, um, and I can't remember what the bill is. What what is it called? The um, talking about the Blair Bill? No, no. I'm talking about um, with uh, the tax exempt status of charities. What do they call that? Five hundred one C three. That 501c3 status, right? <clears throat> so somehow, back in 1892, Protestant churches says, we don't want any more money from the government. But we can see that over time, that really the Protestant churches have aligned themselves with the government, just as the Adventist church has, because of money. And this idea that you would have to have some kind of tax exempt status, um, I mean, it's a very satanic idea. I mean, churches really, the government, they, they shouldn't exist as institutions that can be taxed. 
I mean, ideally, there should be a separation of church and state. Churches shouldn't have to get a status in order to, to not pay taxes. But the problem here is people want a tax-deductible receipt. Now, now, I'm not sure, sure I fully understand the problem. I don't understand quite how we got here. But we talked about this before. We talked about the idea that, the, you know, the government has this heavy tax upon us. And, and that wouldn't be the case in 1892. Right? Taxes are mostly going to be sales taxes. <clears throat> Um, when did income tax begin? The first income tax occurred during the Civil War. <clears throat> but temporarily. Yes, just temporarily. And then yeah. it was instituted as a permanent fixture in 1913. Okay, so during the, it connected with the First World War. No. Well, not, Ameri not. Ameri it was before the First World yeah. War, as far as America was concerned. Right, but but probably connected somewhat with that. That they're foreseeing something, maybe I don't know. But anyway, um, we have this idea then of <clears throat> uh, income tax. And, and that how this affects a Christian is, is quite simple. That is, if I make, let's say, just say $1,000 a month, and I'm going to pay $100 in tithe, but I'm going to be taxed by the government, and let's say it was just at, you know, a 10% tax, which, of course, it's not. It's much more than that. Um, as a Christian, I would I would want to have... Well, I would have less money to give because I'm being taxed. So, I mean, I would I would have to put my 10 percent um, the 10 percent that I would be paying a tithe. I would just mark it from the money that's left over after the government took money. Now, some people pay tithe on their entire income. Depends on which tax bracket you're in. If you're being taxed 90%, uh, you couldn't possibly do that. Um, and I know that taxes have gone as high as um, in, in England as 95% if you were in a certain bracket. So if you're, you know, if you're only getting a nickel, the government's getting 95 cents for every dollar you're making, you definitely could not pay your tithe on your entire income. But um, the problem uh, then becomes quite, uh, you know, it, it basic, basically, if you take the money of, of what you have after taxes, uh, what would be the particular problem of paying on that? Why would we need this tax exempt status on the money that you paid? It would only be so that you could give more money to the church, right? It would mean that. 10% of that tax that you've been taxed uh, because you gave it to the church, now you're you're not taxed as much, right? Is that how it works? That would be the way that some would think that it would work. Okay. So, so the church would end up getting more money because of tax-exempt status because they could issue these tax-deductible receipts. I, I still don't understand why the church has got involved in this in the first place. I mean, I, I don't think the point is to just have more money for the church. That, to me, um, you would want to have to be free from government control. And, and there's I, no I way you can take money and, and not be controlled. Yeah, Ron? Well, you know, um, we get a certain amount of of tax credit for our donations to a tax exempt organization with receipts. All right. So that means you can give a little bit more money to the church if you get tax exempt status. Yeah. Uh, theoretically. Yeah. Yeah. 
that seems like a, a poor reason to to get tax exempt status. The whole thing to me is a confusion. The whole tax system. <laughs> Well, yes, I understand that. But, you know, I know in the Alberta Conference, you know, in Canada, the provinces control education. They're not controlled by the federal government. And the Adventist Church in the province of Alberta, in order to get money, um, because people pay taxes, of course, property taxes, and that money has to go towards their children's education. And, and so the church wants to have that money, and the only way they can get it is by um, bowing to the government. So that means they have to teach what the government wants them to teach, or else they don't get this money. Now, oddly, it, makes, uh, it doesn't really help uh, Christian education much, because people have to still pay tons of money for Christian education. Uh, which public education, of course, is free. Um, <clears throat> but of course, why would you want Christian education if it's really just the same as the public education? I mean, maybe you can teach a few things uh, different, but it, it sort of defeats the whole purpose of a Christian education. I've so, always kind of looked at it uh, as a, you know, you, as a parent, you look more at a Christian education of being somewhat more healthier than a public education. And it, uh, oftentimes that's not actually the case. It's worse in my yeah. experience. It's been my experience as well. Because if you, if your child, I mean, I don't think the pub, I would put my children in the public schools, but at least the child can know they're different and that they're, that they're what's being taught is not what they believe. But if they're going to uh, an Adventist school, I mean, they're going to assume what's being taught is what they are to believe. Right. Right. And, and the example that they see, the unchristian example they see of the, the students and of course the teachers as well um, is going to make an infidel out of them much more readily than if they went to a public school. And, and I, I know this from experience and also um, from statistics. This data has been collected by other people, but the best of course is homeschooling, which the church does not support. The church does not like it when its members homeschool. Yeah. And it's very difficult for a pastor not to put their children in public schools or in church schools um, because the church expects it. And if they were to, to homeschool their children, uh, they would be highly frowned upon. All right. So in order to, to be a pastor, you have to support the institutions of the church, even if they're detrimental to your children. <clears throat> so anyway, I mean, it's sort of uh, an aside here, but the basic principle that we, that we look at here is that people are motivated to align themselves with powers like the government and so forth um, just for the sake of money. And, and money isn't the most important thing, but for some people it is. Now, the other thing, of course, here we see that, <clears throat> that Jones is not recognizing really what has to happen in order for this Sunday law to come about. That is, the Sunday law doesn't come about uh, really from the top down. In order for a Sunday law to be successful, it would be need, to, need to be supported by the masses, not just by some churches, not just by some politicians, not just by the papacy. But there would need to be a, a general um, acceptance of a Sunday law, which has still always been a problem to me. How can, how can a Sunday law occur in a secular society? And so we've seen some ways in which that can occur. I mean, it can be connected to environmentalism. You know, we need one day off uh, uh, a week, you know, so that we don't use as much fossil fuels or something. Right. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so anyway, he's focused here upon the Catholic Church. And I think that the parallel that we would see here is how we, as Seventh-day Adventists, as people in this movement, haven't fully understood where the problem lies. Now, in this case, what, I, what I'm saying, the parallel here, is he's looking at something outside of the Protestants themselves to bring about this. Now, the Protestants, of course, are going to be complicit in this because the Protestants have, have been the ones that have caused the government to move in this direction. Okay, so I'm going to read a bit more here. I'm skipping quite a bit, but now he's going to talk about Brother Conradi, who's um, in Germany. Here's a word that Brother Conradi gave today, which is taken from a paper from Germany. It is the boast that the Catholic Church is making respecting is making respecting Germany now. Germany, you know, is the grand model Protestant nation of Europe. This is taken from a Catholic paper, so it is the voice of the Catholics on this question. And he quotes here, the Catholic papers in Germany declare openly that soon the power will be in their hands and Germany return to the Catholic faith. As two and one half millions of dollars have been appropriated for the Protestant cathedral at Berlin, they said this was all right as soon as it would become Catholic anyway. Now, what do we know about um, Germany and the Catholic Church in this period from uh, 1892 through the First World War, the Second World War. I mean, Germans are Lutherans, right? Generally. Germany was fairly well divided between Catholic and Lutheran, yes. Yeah, so it's it's going to become, does it become more Catholic or do Lutherans just become more Catholic in thinking? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know a lot about this history. I'm not an expert on Germany. Uh, I mean, I've read books about Adolf Hitler and 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 what happened uh, with the Second World War, then with the Jews and so forth. Um, now, one thing I know about Canada. So Canada is a um, an English and a French country. So we have two official languages and we have the problem, pro the problem of Quebec. We have the province of Quebec um, that is primarily Catholic, even though uh, it's an extremely secular state, very, very worldly. But most Catholics or most uh, French speaking uh, Quebecers are, are going to be Catholic or identify as Catholic. And because of that, we have two different school systems. We have what we call uh, the public school system. And in Protestant provinces, we have the Catholic school system. So Alberta is a Protestant province. So you have the public school and you have the Catholic schools. It's sometimes referred to as the separate schools, um, which I think is the official thing, but often they're called Catholic schools. Now in Quebec, the public schools are the Catholic schools. And so if you're a Protestant and you don't want to go to the public schools, you then go to the separate school, which is going to be Protestant. Um, but we have this sort of divide, you know, Protestant and Catholic. Of course, the Protestants aren't very Protestant and the Catholics aren't very Catholic. They used to be much more in the past. I'm not sure um, how that relates to something in Germany. Um, because I would think right now Germany is probably a pretty secular society. That the Catholics are, probably aren't very Catholic and the Protestants, Lutherans aren't very Lutheran. But I don't know. I mean, I, but I assume it's pretty similar to what we have here. Okay. Um, so this idea that, well, it's going to become Catholic anyway. The point is, does it need to become Catholic in order for the Catholic Church to be victorious? Does it, isn't it just that Protestants have to change and become more Catholic? 
Yeah. Yes. And no. And yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've seen, of course, we have hindsight on our part. I mean, we know how the Protestant churches have um, bridged that gap between the, the Catholic church, which didn't exist at this time. Protestant churches are generally not favorable of Catholicism. Uh, but that's definitely changed. And I know in the 1960s with Vatican II and the changes that happened there, um, and also know the, the social gospel, uh, many Protestant churches bought into this idea and were really seeking uh, ecumenical movement towards all of these churches uh, becoming uh, brothers. Of course, the daughters coming back to their mother um, is the way the Catholic Church would see it. So, so we know about the ecumenical movement, which didn't exist really in any kind of level that I know of in the 1890s. So as Adventists, we focused a lot upon ecumenism and how that's been progressing. Um, so for some people, that was really a big issue. Some people, just the fact that the Protestant churches uh, have this moral majority idea back in the 1990s. And of course, um, now we just see, you know, we've had some popular popes, Pope John Paul II and now Pope Francis, who not only do Protestants um, approve of him, but also atheists. So, so the world has been changing. And, and do we fully understand how this Sunday law is going to come about? I thought she said it was going to be coming through the legislative branch of the government. Right. So the first Sunday law in the United States, what we call the National Sunday Law, um, it's going to be the the legal or the <clears throat> The legislative part of the government that is going to bring about the Sunday law. But of course, it's going to be supported, right? It's not going to just be something that gets, uh, you know, attached to some bill somewhere. There's going to be a general acceptance of the principles behind why they're bringing in a Sunday law. But that doesn't really help as much as how do we get a secular society as, such as we have today supporting a sunday law <clears throat> so when Tess, national day of rest well yeah but when tess was <clears throat> presenting her idea that there was no sunday law I, I actually found it um plausible in that the sunday law in our time was going to be manifest in a different way uh than than it would have been if it had occurred in Jones history, A.T. Jones history. And that is, <clears throat> a test was right about one thing. Uh, Ellen White didn't start talking about a national Sunday law at first. She did talk about a Sunday law, but she always referred to the Sunday law that occurred after the close of probation. And that was connected with the death decree. So that Sunday law is still, um, that's the worldwide Sunday law. That's the one where people will be able to kill those who are not following, you know, the, the Sunday. This idea of the national Sunday law uh, is something that occurs later. So in like 1863, Ellen White's not talking about a national Sunday law. If you read her, her books up until really it's going to be the, the great controversy the 1884 great controversy that's really going to bring to light this idea of this national Sunday law that the United States leads. And so the argument was that, well, in that time, that's when we would have had a national Sunday law, but now it's going to be something much more secular. The first Sunday law. Did, um, didn't Miss White have a quote saying that it was going to be brought in by, by um, union forces 
you like the um, unions of the do we have in the United States? I don't know what you mean, union forces. You like um, maybe, United Auto Workers? Yeah. Union. Oh, okay. Yeah. Coal the union. miners union. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry, I didn't mean. I, I yeah, I understand what you're talking about. Okay, so yes, so the unions are binding people into bundles into bundles to be burned, right? That and and so that would be. I mean, that's one thing that we we have to take into account that this is then unions are involved because unions are not very Christian, not by any means. So. Um, so why are unions involved in this Sunday law? So that's that's one thing we, we we know that she made this statement. But again, this is the national Sunday law she's talking about, uh, which is much later. Now, so so the idea that I had, you know, that that I, I found at least plausible is that initially this Sunday law would not be a Sunday law as such. It would be uh, something much more secular. I mean, it might it might entail, um, you know, getting a day off or something like that. One day a week, maybe on Sunday, but it wouldn't be what we would think of as the Sunday law. But but I, I've you know, I've abandoned that view of Tess's um, <clears throat> because there's lots of problems with it. Uh, one is it's based upon a dispensational law argument which i don't think we can take ellen white is talking about our time when she talks about the sunday law that precedes the close of probation mm. right so so there was there was problems with it but i did consider it i found some it answered some problems i had but it created more problems but it's still a problem that we have we don't quite know how this what is the catalyst for this sunday law so sometimes we look at well it's going to be an economic collapse and that's going to be bring about the sunday law or it's going to be some kind of disaster maybe a natural disaster or maybe a war or maybe nashville being hit by a fireball or by islam right so there are these different things we try to see as a catalyst but there has to be something behind it Right. I mean, just because you have an economic collapse doesn't mean that everybody's automatically going to go to a Sunday law as a solution. There has to be something that happens first. And, and I still don't think that I fully understand how this Sunday law is going to come about. Other than I know that there is going to be a Sunday law and that it is what this movement is studying and trying to understand. Now, some people have tried to because we know the pandemic's the type of the Sunday law, that in a sense, when we, we look at the vaccination mandates as sort of not just a type of the Sunday law, but as the way in which we are controlled or manipulated. So the idea, I mean, I'm using an extreme example, is that somehow we get vaccinations. And these vaccinations made up, make us controlled by the state. They change us so that we're no longer human and we can be manipulated and against our will. But of course, the problem there is that this goes totally against uh, the idea of the gospel, that people make a choice, um, and that many people would get vaccinated who wouldn't be aware of all of the issues. And you know, if they just had their mind controlled because of the vaccine, um, that wouldn't really mean anything. they in a sense would have their individual responsibility for their actions. Uh, they'd have an excuse for it, but we know that no one has an excuse. Satan cannot control our mind without us allowing him to. So if they turn us into a bunch of zombies and drugged people and, and get us to comply to a Sunday law, it doesn't really mean anything in the big scheme of things. Won't meet any of the conditions, right? Right. Because people need to make a choice. God is offering us a choice. And those who have their choice taken away, um, God doesn't allow that to happen. 
But anyway, I mean, this is sort of all an aside. It's just that when we look at the issue here with Joe's, we see that he's trying to look at the situation that's occurring in his time and trying to understand that as it relates to Revelation 18. But I don't think he has enough information to draw the conclusions that he does. But he is giving a message that Ellen White endorses. And he Ellen White endorses it because it's causing confession and repentance to occur. So he's presenting the gospel here. Now, we, we don't see it as much here, though he's laying out some principles. Um, and we're going to see it more as we get through his sermons in, in understanding righteousness by faith. But um, there's still something something missing. But but again, it's endorsed by Ellen White, so it's not wrong. It's just not the right time. And it could have been if the truth could have advanced, if people would have accepted this message more, more fully. Now, he's going to go on here. We're going to read a bit more of Jones. So I, I left uh, all of that away. Um, I'm not going to read more of that. I think well, we got the last paragraph of that, that uh, article. Um, I think that's actually the one Conrad, he said, from the German paper. Okay, and he says, and these things are going on before the world, and the world sees them, and the world reads them. Brethren, has not God given us a word to say on this subject? Here's a word on that. Speaking of the papacy in the chapter in the Great Controversy, Volume 4, on the character and aims of the papacy, page 579, it is said, she can read what is to be. When she, with the light only of the wisdom that Satan can give, the wisdom gathered from her wicked experience only, the wisdom gathered only from her own history, when she can by this see what is to be, what is to be, does it not become a people to whom God speaks to see also what is to be? So that is the Catholic Church, um, if we take this statement, I want to go to it. Uh, I want to look at it more in context. So just I'm going to copy this here. <clears throat> and now he's saying this is from uh, volume four of the Great Controversy. Um, so I want to look if I can. I'm going to read it from that, not from the later edition of the Great Controversy. Theodore, when Constantine wouldn't wouldn't it, um, when Constantine um, and and enacted the Sunday law, would, wouldn't it wouldn't it be like a secular government enforcing the Sunday law? Okay. That's a good question. So when we look at the Sunday law of Constantine, it's different from the Sunday law that happens in the United States. It's the first Sunday law, but it's something that's coming from the top down. It's being imposed by the government okay. on, upon the people, right? Right. That's not what happens in the Sunday law in the United States. The United States, because it's a government of, of the people, right? The people are the ones who really are the government. It's really that the people are behind this Sunday law. Now, we know that that's the first Sunday law, but the Sunday law is progressive. It changes and morphs as it moves through history. And the Sunday law in the United States is enacted when the Protestants have had this, this fall that happened in, in the 1840s. It's going to be this more complete fall, morally, that the Protestant church is corrupt. Right? So it, it's going to be degraded. And it's going to come from the Protestants. Right? It's going to be the United States, which is a Republican and Protestant government that has repudiated both Protestantism and Republicanism, right? So even though 
the one in 321 is a Sunday law. It's very different from the Sunday law that's coming to the United States. Because it's in a different place in prophecy. But definitely it's it it's typified by what happened in 321. Okay, so let's let's read some of this here. Okay, Ellen White says, these records of the past clearly reveal the enmity of Rome toward the true Sabbath and its defenders, and the means which she employs to honor the institution of her creating. The word of God teaches that these scenes are to be repeated as papists and Protestants shall unite for the exaltation of the Sunday. For nearly 40 years, Sabbath reformers have presented this testimony to the world, and the events now taking place uh, is seen a rapid advance toward the fulfillment of the prediction. There is the same claim of divine authority for Sunday keeping, the same lack of scriptural evidence as in the days of papal supremacy. The assertion that God's judgments are visited upon men for their violation of the Sunday Sabbath will be repeated. Already it is beginning to be urged. Marvelous in her shrewdness and cunning is the Romish church. She can read what is to be. She bides her time, seeing that the Protestant churches are paying her homage in their acceptance of the fall Sabbath, and that they are preparing to employ the very means which she herself employed in bygone days. Those who reject the light of truth will yet seek the aid of this self-styled infallible power to exalt an institution that originated with her. How readily she she will come to the help of Protestants in this work. It is not difficult to conjecture. Who understands better than Popery how to deal with those who are disobedient to the church? So we can see here, the Protestants have become like the Catholic Church. But the Catholic Church will be there. But the, but the Catholic Church doesn't need to be in control of all of these other churches in order for, or, and governments, in order for the Sunday law to occur, right? But when the Sunday law comes, it's going to lead to putting the papacy upon the throne of the earth, right? So when we have this Sunday law that happens after the close of probation with the death decree, that Sunday law would be, um, connected to the, the papacy much more directly and also to Satan's personation of Christ. Correct? Where am I off track? Well, the Sunday law in the United States is not done, done by the papacy. No, it's not. But the death decree Sunday law would be. Well, it, 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 in um, Great Controversy 578 and 579, yeah. it uh, says public, co public corruption is destroying the love of justice and regarding, regard, regarding of truth. And even in free America, rules and legislatures in order to secure public favor will yield to puppet, po popular demand for a Sunday enforcement laws. I mean, a law enforcing Sunday observance. Yeah, so it's going to come from popular demand. Yeah. That means the changes happen in Americans, not just the government itself. Yeah. Right. Not just I a few churches called them for Sunday legislation. What's that, William? I was, I, was, I was just reading it. I just thought I'd share it. Okay, thanks. So um, it says in the next uh, paragraph here, the Christian world will learn what Romanism really is when it is too late to escape the snare. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, 
and in the churches and in the hearts of men. Throughout the land, she is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. She is stealthily and unsuspectedly strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is soon to be given her. In the near future, we shall see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. Now, so just in this last little bit, we got about 15 minutes. Um, let's take a look at this from uh, a perspective of Revelation. Um, the book of Revelation and chapter 12. So, <clears throat> well, we're going to look at chapter 12 and 13. So remember, we start with Rome, right? So it's going to be Rome that's going to bring about the first Sunday law, right? That's going to be Constantine. Now, he's a Roman emperor. Right. Okay. And we can see in Revelation 12 that there is this great red dragon. This is, is pagan Rome, but it's also Satan, right? Mm -hmm. Primarily, he's a symbol of Satan, but also a symbol of pagan Rome, Ellen White says. And, and I'm not going to go into detail and in everything here, but we know that the woman's going to flee into the wilderness, right? Now, that means that this... This um, great red dragon, which is is pagan in, pagan Rome, is going to persecute God's people, but they're going to flee into the wilderness. Now we know that this fleeing into the wilderness is going to start in 538. It actually is at the end of pagan persecution, but that means that this is talking about a transition between pagan Rome and papal Rome. Even here in Revelation 12, verse 6, which is a symbol of 126, 126 right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, it's going to go to this war in heaven, which I'm going to leave. But this is going to talk about basically that change, right? How this is going to happen. And, and then we're going to see in chapter 13, the papacy rising, right? And so this is going to be this beast. Um, that rises up out of the sea, right? Having seven heads and 10 horns and upon his horns, 10 crowns and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And I'm not going to go into the whole study that we did on Revelation 12 and 13, but I'm going to focus on one part here. And it says the beast, which I saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon pagan Rome gave him his power, his seat and great authority. Now, what are these th three things, and when do we mark them? <laughs> okay, the simplest one. When did he give his seat? When did pagan Rome give his seat to this beast, which is the papacy? That's when... Um... Move the Roman Empire. Yeah. Okay. The seat. When was Rome? When did Constantine? He moved the seat to um, Constantinople. Okay. And that was uh, that's when the Pope succeeded him, or he he made the Pope the uh, vicar of Christ. Okay. Right. Now, I can't remember um, the date exactly. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the date myself. Um, yeah. Uh, um, Going through my notes. Yeah. So. Uh, I don't know if he's going to help us here. Um, that is Uriah Smith. I'm trying to remember the, the dates here. So anyway, the event is the moving of the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople. That was that means, and the Roman pontiff then 
he's going to be given actually these titles. Um, 476, wasn't it? 476? No. I think that's it. No. That's the fall of Rome. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. It's in it's in the 300s. Cuz it's Constantine, right? I right. just can't remember the year. Okay, so we're going to have the seat. Now, 321. It is in 321? Yeah, AD Sunday law. Did, when he gives the Sunday law that year? Yes. Okay. Twenty-one. That's right. I have it in my notes there. Okay. So I was wondering if it was around there, but okay, it's 321. I just need citation on that. That's all. Now, now what about the dragon giving him his power? What is the power that's given to the papacy from? Corrector of heretics. And, and and we should note it's his power and his seat. So this is something that Rome already has. Hmm. Hmm. Ask your question again, please. Okay. So Ellen White's going to, uh, well, the question is, what is the power? So I'm going to go to the great controversy here. Um, try to understand this a little better. I know that Iran put 508. Um, we're going to have to. That was Clovis. That was the date that Clovis was baptized. Yeah. So. Okay, so Ellen White, uh, this is um, uh, the chapter uh, three where it it, it's basically talking about Second Thessalonians, right? So she's actually presenting the, the pioneer view of the daily um, without talking about the daily directly. Uh, the apostate has succeeded in exalting himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. He had dared to change the only precept of the divine law that points to the true and living God. In the fourth commandment, God is revealed as the creator, as a memorial of the work of creation. The seventh day was sanctified as a rest day for man, designed to keep the living God ever before the minds of men as the object of worship. Satan strives to, to turn man from obedience to God's law. Therefore, he directs his efforts, especially against that commandment, which points to God as the creator. Protestants now urge that the resurrection of Christ on Sunday made it the Christian Sabbath, but no such honor was given to the day by Christ or his apostles. The observance of Sunday had its origin in that mystery of lawlessness. Even in Paul's day had begun its work. What reason can be given for a change which the scriptures do not sanction? Now, Ellen White then says in the sixth century, so that's in 538, the Bishop of Rome was declared to be the head over the entire church. Paganism had given place to the papacy. The dragon had given the beast his power and his seat and great authority. Now, um, th this is in the, fo uh, the footnotes or the, the appendix. Okay, prophetic dates. An important principle of interpreting time prophecies is the year-day principle under which a prophetic time equals a year of calendar time. Some of the Bible reasons for this principle are as followed. Uh, the year-day principle is in harmony with the principle of symbolically interpreting beasts as kingdoms, horns as powers, oceans as people, etc. Um, so it's going to talk about this here. So it's, it's going to be dealing with the 1260 years. We're just seeing if this is going to say anything about these dates, the power seat and great authority. Um, I think it's mostly going to focus upon what happens in 538. Okay, so so that's not going to help us too much um, to get these actual dates. And I, I should remember these. I just can't remember. Um, so so we're going to say the seat is 321. So what about his power? Would that be associated with 
what power does the does Rome have that it's going to give to the papacy, and when does it do that? Okay, what about great authority? And, and how does that differ from power? So, so first, we'd have to say power is different than great authority, right? So wouldn't power be military power? Yeah, the possibility is there. Okay, so wouldn't we put that as 508? That's going to be the baptism of Clovis. Because right. France is going to be the one that puts the papacy upon the throne of the earth. That's right. right. Okay. Now, the great authority, um, Justinian, um, is, is the one who then is going to be involved in that. So this is going to be the, the power to persecute. And that would be 538. Now, I know there are some people have differences of opinion about this, especially the power. They put it back to Clovis's conversion. Mm. But we now know that Clovis was baptized in 508, not in um, 496, which I think was the other date that people generally put for the power. So now I bring this up because we're dealing with the Sunday law. Right, and answering that question. So here we have this Sunday law, which, which Rome brings in. But Rome is then going to give the seat. And, and of course, we're going to see France, which is going to give its power. Now, why would we say that the dragon is giving power? Why would we have pagan Rome giving his power to the papacy when it's France. How, how is this pagan Rome giving its power? And how is this pagan Rome giving great authority? Because th this is a fundamental question uh, if, if we understand the daily correct correctly. Is the papacy... I mean, the papacy is what? What is the papacy? How does it differ from pagan paganism? It's got both um, religious, religious, and when it gets its power, I reckon he gets both the religious and the civil. Okay, so. Um, So paganism, pagan Rome, is conquered by, by who? The papacy. By the papacy, right? But in order to do that, pagan Rome is first going to give its seat of power to, to the bishop of Rome, right? 321, right. Dwight says. And, and then we're going to see that um, France, which is, is now become converted to, to uh, Catholicism, is going to give its power. So there's a change that happens, but really it's Rome still, even though, you know, it's mm. France. Because France is one of the... Ten parts that Rome was divided. Right. So Rome has been divided. And so France, in a sense, is still Rome, right? Even yes. though it's converted to Christianity, it's still it's still an inheritance of pagan Rome. And then the great authority, these are going to be the laws of Justinian that are going to give it this power for the church to persecute. And that's going to be 538. So 
So now if we're going to deal with the Sunday law and how we look at what's happening presently, how do we relate what happened in 538? How do we relate that to the present Sunday law that's coming? Mark, you have a question? Or yes, um, I say hi to you, Fido, and all very many. So, mm -hmm. Tim, sorry, I try to get home for before seven thirty. Could you? I ask, could you guys and Fido to let me to catch up what you did say at seven thirty? Okay. So, so Mark. Um, Simple thing is what we're looking at is we're looking at um, what happened in 1892 and 1893 um, in the United States with um, the Sunday law in connection with the Chicago World Fair. And we're looking at the parallel to our time. But what we did is we went further back and we looked at what happened in the Sunday laws in the past. So we can see that these are also types of Sunday laws. The giving of the power seat and great authority are all tied to the idea of a Sunday law. So if we were to look at the present situation, how does that parallel what's happening? Ron, you have a thought? Uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, could you repeat that, please? Okay. So we look at what happened in the tr transition from paganism to papalism, and we see that these are types of the Sunday law, right? We often, well, 321, we have a Sunday law in 321. 508, Christmas Day in 508, Clovis is baptized. Even though most people had put it in 496, we now know it's in 508. And that's a type of the Sunday law. It's a symbol. It's Christmas Day, right? Uh, we also have 538, Justinian's decree. So these laws of Justinian also typify a Sunday law. How do these all come together in our present situation in the world, in our understanding of how a Sunday law comes about? I mean, Ellen White's give us, given us some clues there. Because, because the, the, the first Sunday law in three, 21 is like the, the Sunday law uh, in Daniel 11, 41, or in United States. And, okay. and the 538 is the Sunday law in the white world. Okay. Yeah, so we can see all these other Sunday laws speak to our Sunday law, but specifically, how do they illustrate how the Sunday law comes about? Uh, uh, oh, how the Sunday law comes about in in the in the United States or or the, yeah, in the United the States Sunday law? Yeah. So how does the United States come about? How does the Sunday law come about? How is this illustrating? Uh, I mean, I oh. Okay. I I think it's when. 
when when United States uh, speak as a dragon. Okay. Dragon. Okay. The question I'm asking: Does power, seat, and great authority do they parallel something in our time? Like, does the seat symbolize something that occurs in our time? Does the power symbolize something? Does the great authority symbolize something? Well, all you, those things need to be, he needs to receive these things, right? In order to wield these things. Right. So... so how have we, how has he received these things yet? I don't see him as receiving them as yet. Okay. Okay. Now, when it comes to power, if this is military power, has military power of the United States been given to the papacy? Well, not, not outright, I would say. Well, what about 1989? Yeah, we, yeah, okay, so yeah, I guess you could, it was the American might, uh, and that could have been military, and probably was. Okay. And so clandestine can, ways. Right, okay, so we can see the seat represents the power of the United States. Okay. In the earlier history, it's representing the power of France. Right. right? That's right, now it is the states. Right, okay. But what about the seat? I mean... Nobody's giving the papacy that I know of right presently, um, you know, the seat of Rome. I mean, that would be the United States government. Um, uh, brother, I, I think the seat, uh, the seat, uh, the, 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 the United Nations is the one who give the seat to the papacy okay because oh. mm -hmm. because uh, 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 in that time is the universal sandy law okay so so we would we we can take say that the seat here the giving of his seat is connected to the united nations of uh, being um connected to the sunday law Agreeable. Okay. Great authority. W what would that symbolize? Well, where he could wield authority on a you know worldwide level, that would be great authority, all right. Okay. So, so this is still something future that has. I would say so. And I, and I would say that this this is actually showing a progression of the Sunday law. Yeah. Okay. I could see that. So, I mean, we know in 1989 this happened, but I think we would see this is happening further. Exactly how it happens, I don't know. But all I'm saying, and, and this is something we still need to study, is that what Jones is neglecting to look at is is really how this Sunday law comes about and that he's not paralleling it with the past Sunday laws to understand it fully. So he's in a typical Sunday law, just as we have been with the pandemic. And, and so I don't think we still fully understand. We, we can look at these, these symbols, power, seat, and great authority, and we can see that they relate to the Sunday law but we don't know specifically how yet, mm -hmm. but I think we do need to understand it. I agree. So, you know, right after Ellen White says this, I mean, she talks about the 1260 years of papal oppression. Well, we use the 1260 as a symbol that leads us to 1989, right? Internally, right. It, it points to 2014 in this movement, right? Going from 1888. And we've also applied it uh, to 1893, right? So that brings us to 2019. 
again, internally. So these are the things that we're going to have to try to understand. Um, so one of the things, and, and we've talked about this earlier, is that this idea of righteousness by faith and its connection to the Sunday law, to the Sabbath, we understand it in a sense, but we haven't understood it fully. And, and I think that's really what we're trying to, because we're doing a study here on righteousness by faith. But we're, we're having to deal with the, the Sunday law. Jones is doing a presentation on righteousness by faith, but he's addressing the Sunday law. And so that's really where we're going to have to dig in. Sorry, I went a little bit long there. Okay, so. That's okay. At least I didn't fall asleep this time. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> okay. So anyway, we're going to close with prayer. And uh, so let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we had studying this evening. We pray for. Dwight's study tomorrow morning. Help us to get a good rest so we can have clear minds. And um, we just pray, Lord, that you can continue this work that you have begun and that you can complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. May your Holy Spirit rest upon each person. May this Sabbath truly be a blessing is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.